Act One of The Time Is Not Yet Ripe by Lewis Essen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Time Is Not Yet Ripe A Comedy in Four Acts. Characters Sir Joseph Quiberton, Prime Minister of Australia. Read by Algie Pug. Doris, read by Beth Thomas. English Butler, read by Frances Brown. Sir Henry Pillsbury, Attorney General, read by John Smith. Lady Pillsbury, read by Todd. John K. Hill, a Chicago drummer, read by Nick Polka. Sidney Barrett, read by Christine G. Miss Perkins, Secretary, Anti Socialist League. Read by Libby Gaughan. Otto of the Socialist Party. Read by Lars Rolander. Harry Hopkins of the Socialist Party. Read by Phil Benson. Peter Jensen of the Socialist Party. Read by Lars Rolander. Arthur Gray. Read by Peter Tucker. Bertie Wainwright. Read by Ben Lindsay Clark. Violet Faulkner. B A L L B. Read by Savannah Alday. Fat Man. Read by Lambda. Cheeky Youth. Read by Victoria. Working Woman. Read by Abai. An Old Man in the Crowd. Read by Robert Dixon. Socialists. Read and sung by Peter Tucker. Socialist Songs. Sung by Lars Rolander. Narrated by Janet. Act 1. The Prime Minister's Drawing Room After Dinner Enter Sir Joseph Quiverton, followed by Doris. Not another word. I refuse to give the matter further consideration. I tell you, Doris, finally, irrevocably. Listen a moment, Father. You haven't finished your coffee. I will not listen. I should have forbidden you to speak. This thing is preposterous, impossible. I know it is difficult for a politician to preserve an open mind. At present I am not a politician. I am your father. Why do you raise these technical points? We will sit down quietly and have a little chat on the subject. Shall I bring in your coffee? No. And I don't want to debate with my own daughter. I am shocked, Doris, and deeply wounded. Wasn't I right to tell you I was engaged? Yes. No. Not to a man like that. Never in all my experience have I heard of such a thing. If you have no self-respect, you might at least think of the dignity of my position. Father! Don't answer me. Barrett is a socialist, a revolutionary socialist. That is sufficient. He has a big station in the Riverina, and goodness knows how many sheep. I love sheep. He proposes to confiscate land and capital. Not his own, father. Sidney may be a socialist and an advanced atheist, but he is not a philanthropist. I thank you for the information. It deeply gratifies me to learn that my prospective son-in-law is not only a revolutionary socialist, but also an advanced atheist, a most promising young man, a credit to his country. Father, have I your consent or not? My consent? Never. I mean to fight the next election on this very issue of socialism versus private enterprise. You know I am no Tory. I am a progressive man and believe in a policy of progress and reform. Everybody says that before an election. Doris, for the sake of the party, for the sake of the country, for the sake of the empire, for my sake, you must give up this folly. Love is not folly. Plato says that love is the highest wisdom. Plato is wrong. And that's the stuff they want to introduce into the university. Have I no authority left? No, I am the last one to be considered. Now, Doris, children must obey their parents. You're mistaken, Father. In the natural cause of evolution, parents must be sacrificed to their children, not children to their parents. It is a law of nature. There is such a thing as a moral law, Doris. No, there isn't, Father. That is a popular fallacy. People used to think there was, but there isn't. I have always given you your own way, and this is my reward. 
Don't you realize that the country is in a critical condition? I want you to understand my aims, my policy. I'm sorry, Father, but I don't believe in your policy. What? I would like to, but I can't. You can't? No, Father. Once I used to believe in the things you do, but I've got beyond that stage. That is good, very good indeed. I have devoted thirty years of my life to formulating a progressive liberal policy that has won the confidence of the country. And now my own daughter tells me, to my face, that she has got beyond it. What is the world coming to? Sydney says the liberal policy is an anachronism. You must put Sydney out of your thoughts. His influence is immoral. Listen, Father. Please don't interrupt me. This is a pretty situation for the leader of a great party. What will the opposition say when it learns that my daughter is engaged to a socialist, a revolutionary socialist? I will retire at once. I will give up public life. My day is past. I won't be made a laughing stock by my unscrupulous opponents. And we are on the eve of an election. The country needs my services. So much to do, so little done. Enter Butler. Sir Henry and Lady Pillsbury. Enter Sir Henry and Lady Pillsbury. Exit Butler. Good evening. Delighted you have come. I would have called before, only I had a touch of neuralgia. My wife enjoys the most extraordinary bad health. Nerves. Strikes always upset me. I loathe paid agitators. They take seats. These salons are sure to have a great educational influence. It is so pleasant to drop in and exchange ideas on the great political problems. The educated classes must be organised to protect their rights. What do you think of the baker's strike, Sir Henry? I can only trust that wise counsels will prevail. Is it going to last forever? One never knows. One never knows. I refuse to use cake on principle. It is encouraging the bakers. I noticed Brett made another inflammatory speech this afternoon. That is a dangerous man. Most dangerous. And he is a Rhodes Scholar, if I remember rightly. That makes his conduct all the more uncalled for. I have never met the young man. Mr. Barrett holds very advanced views, and that unfits him for fashionable society. He may look in tonight. Surely you didn't invite him. I thought it would do him good. How can a squatter be a socialist, even if he has been educated at Oxford? I am not a spiritualist, Lady Pillsbury. I do not pretend to explain the supernatural. Sir Henry, airily. We are all socialists nowadays. But Barrett is an extremist, a revolutionary socialist. At the Wagga Wagga Agricultural Show dinner, he said the present land tax was a farce and should be raised to 15 shillings in the pound. Yes, I know. He is inclined to exaggerate a little. That is not all. He is setting class against class. And where is it going to end? If our squatters adopt such views... What can be expected from the trades unionists? Please don't worry, Father. It is becoming a mannerism. We must convert, Mr Barrett. We must always hope for the best. Sir Joseph, ready for long speech. The situation is grave. Great issues are at stake. What do we see around us? Unrest and discontent. We are standing, as it were, at the parting of the ways. Doris, breaking in. Bridge or music? You might play something, dear. A little American piece. I have a slight headache. I'm so sorry. The ladies rise. It is always a strain listening to intellectual conversation. Exuant Doris and Lady Pillsbury. How is Lady Pillsbury keeping now? Much better, thanks. She complains only about half her time. That Barrett is a violent young man. Indeed he is. I heard a rumour he was going to stand for Parliament. What? How? Why? It was only a rumour. Standing for Parliament? Oh, well, nothing surprises me now. Enter Butler. 
Enter John K. Hill. Mr. John K. Hill. Exit Butler. Sir Henry Pillsbury, our Attorney General, Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill is an ambassador of commerce. No, sir. I am a plain man of figures. And a maker of nations. I just financed that little revolution in Uruguay. There usually seems to be trouble in that part of the world. And there will be trouble here, too, if the socialists have their way. This country is on the eve of changes, Mr. Hill. Startling changes. You don't say. We are moving too fast. Well, I wouldn't have guessed that now. I am only a visitor. But I was kept waiting in a hat store yesterday afternoon, close on one minute and a half before the young man behind the counter woke up. The new unionism? Australia is an extraordinary country. This is a holiday trip, I presume? No, sir, I never take holidays. I have certain propositions to consider. Your Northern Territory interests me. It is virgin soil. I am a missionary. A missionary traveler. I represent the little Chicago syndicate that wants scope for investment. But I can't advise it to shovel money into a new country without certain concessions. Do you propose to establish industries, Mr. Hill? Yes, sir. That is my business. I want to develop this country, bring it up to time, Americanize it. It has golden possibilities. Take your beche de mer, regarded by Epicure as superior to turtle. Why, it's a beet. It's just crying out to be canned. All we want is freezing works, and cheap labor, and no public banquet will be complete without it. All fisheries have so far been somewhat neglected. And there's your forests of cypress pine. Wonderful forests, absolutely going to waste. Most valuable timber, sir, put to its legitimate use, specially adapted for making Chinese coffins. They use up quite a number over there in China. Ten thousand a day, I have the exact figures. Unlimited market, easy transit to Hong Kong, Revolution is China's long suit nowadays, and it's me to deliver the goods. I'm going to bring death within the reach of all. This country can develop only with the aid of capital. Capital is as necessary as labor. One is the complement of the other. That's so. But if your socialist party gains a majority, won't it pass antitrust legislation? It is difficult to say what it would not do and nationalize the Chinese coffin monopoly and the canned slug monopoly? You can rely on the government, Mr. Hill, to assist you in every way. Thanks, Sir Joseph. We'll stand or fall together. Enter Doris. How do you do? Mr. Hill and I are old friends. I'm honored, Miss Quiverton. And what do you think of Australia now? You have lots of space, I guess. Our sheep require it. Our population is mostly sheep. You forget Mr. Hill has not yet seen the country. I hope you will not be disappointed. Australia is still uncultivated nature. Our scenery, of course, is not so smooth and highly finished as the English, but we can hardly expect that in such a young country. Will you make one for a small game? Lady Pillsbury is devoted to bridge. Exuant Sir Henry and Sir Joseph. We are all keenly interested in politics. It's the latest thing. There is a salon almost every week. As an American, it's almost fascinating to me. Enter Sidney Barrett, as Doris shows John K. Hill into card room and returns. Barrett advances. Oh, Sid, what strange garments. I am a man of the people. How did you get in? By what you call a tradesman entrance. But Doris... You are making yourself positively ridiculous. I, I told father. Was he pleased? Pleased? He went off. I am glad of that. He so seldom does. Goes to kiss her. Wait till I shut the door. I can only give you a few minutes alone. Shuts card room door and returns. Barrett embraces her. Doris, with head on his shoulder. Oh, Sydney, this is all I want. No more. Puts him away. Sit down. Now. Doris takes seat. Do you admire me immensely? I do. You are quite perfect. But, Doris... But what? You are still wearing jewellery. One can express oneself in jewellery. Did I not tell you to discard those pearls? Three times. 
have you never thought of the Cylon diver who held his breath and went all naked to the hungry shark? Does he mind? You said once you would feel transcendently happy if I permitted you to die for me. So I would, in a romantic mood. But, Doris, it is time we had a definite understanding. You must give up your jewellery and bridge and salons and other forms of fashionable frivolity. Does socialism mean that? Of course it does. I am not a socialist, then. I don't believe in it. You are pursuing an illusionary existence. It must end. I wish, Sid, you wouldn't try to reform me. It would be much better for us both if I reform you. Listen, Doris, you must do as I tell you. You are getting as bad as father. What an atmosphere. Bridge and bad politics. Sydney. Here I am, after four years' absence, returned to my native land, full of fine enthusiasm, to find the country stagnant, decadent, and the young Australian, with his bright, fresh mind, untrammelled by the traditions of the past, that is the current phrase, repeating all the popular superstitions, from bear to bishops, of his fog-bound ancestors. Australia is an outer suburb of Brixton. That explains its amazing school of architecture. That explains everything. We are unoriginal, therefore uninteresting. We can't help that, can we? We prate of progress, and what is Australia's chief contribution to civilization? Frozen mutton and the losing hazard. Can you wonder that I am dissatisfied? You always are. Every country must have a national ideal. Even England has a national ideal. Good form. We have nothing, absolutely nothing. Australia is an empty country. We produce wool and cricketers and factory butter and legislative councillors, but we do not produce ideas. Why, the national intelligence has not yet invented one new drink. Things can't go on like this. But where are our leaders? Look at your worthy father. He certainly seems troubled about many things, but he goes on uttering empty phrases, meaning nothing, suggesting nothing. Yes, I know. Father is very tiresome. But what are you proposing to do? Everything. I propose change, disorder, revolution. We will have to make a fresh start. I attended the Socialist Congress tonight. That explains your behaviour. We had a stormy meeting. I was accused of being an intellectual. There was nearly a split in the party. That shows how earnest we are. We are going to do things. You must give up this empty life, Doris. Don't dare me, Sydney. I might do something rash. I have no fear. You are not in revolt. Don't tempt me to prove you are wrong. You don't realise my position. I haven't told you my plans yet. I have something most important to tell you. I decided tonight. Enter Miss Perkins. Great Caesar. Who is that? Miss Perkins. I'm off. I'll tell you my secret later. Mr. Barrett, Miss Perkins. Miss Perkins is the energetic secretary of the Women's Anti-Socialist League. Please sit down. Miss Perkins takes chair. I have hurried round from the League. The business was most important. Barrett escaping. Pray, don't let me disturb you. Exit Barrett. Doris, tired and languid. Was it a pleasant evening? We had a prolonged discussion. You must help us, Miss Quiverton. I shall be delighted. I don't know what the country is coming to. The domestic helps have formed a union. I prefer men servants. They're more docile. They will demand a day at home next. You must assist us, Miss Quiverton. Certainly. You promise to stand by the League. I shall promise anything with pleasure. Enter Lady Pillsbury. We have decided on a most momentous step. How are you, Miss Perkins? Well, I thank you. How are you? We have decided. Bridge is too exciting. Heart, Mr. Barrett has arrived. He is wearing a red tie. Miss Perkins, going ahead. The matter was exhaustively discussed by all our ablest speakers. We came to the conclusion that there was only one way to save the country. And what might that be? Women must take their place in the political arena. You are quite right, Miss Perkins. We have been kept down for centuries by a man-made law. But we are quite capable of directing the destiny of a great nation. 
All we need is more opportunity to display our ability. That is why I never allow my husband to make up his mind on any public question till he has first consulted me. I have an important announcement to make. May I see Sir Joseph? Doris, going to door. Father, Miss Perkins has an important communication to deliver. Enter Sir Joseph and Sir Henry, followed later by John K. Hill and Sidney Barrett. The committee of the League held its fortnightly meeting this evening, Mrs. Jasper Jones occupying the chair. After a short debate, it was decided that it was the duty of every lady in the land to take an active and intelligent interest in the coming elections. The time has arrived when women's refining influence should extend over a wider sphere. I incline to that view myself, but we must not go too far. We must go far enough, Sir Henry, to reach a logical conclusion. The country is in a dreadful condition. Men have not the requisite knowledge to deal adequately with the problem of social reform. That is women's special province. The morality of the nation is in our keeping. Shall we forsake our trust? No, certainly not. I'm glad we agree on that point. Certain names were forwarded for our approval. But after due consideration, we came to the conclusion that there was not one man whom we could conscientiously support. The League decided that the women of this electorate must be represented by a woman. Applause. It is difficult to decide on any definite line of action. Therefore, in the best interests of the country, I have been requested to ask Miss Quiverton to stand for Parliament. Mild sensation. Me? The proposal was carried by acclamation, and with only one dissentient voice. Loud applause. But I don't understand politics. It is not a question of mere politics. It is a question of morality. Of course, that makes a considerable difference. All the difference, my dear. But please tell me how I can promote the morality of the nation. I should be only too delighted. By defeating the socialist candidate. What constituency has been selected for Miss Quiverton? Wombat. Wombat? That doesn't sound particularly moral. Oh, yes. It is only the name of a local bird. There is no time for hesitation. Tomorrow is the last day for nominations. The socialists are selecting their candidate tonight. Will you give me a few moments to think it over? Do try to persuade Miss Quiverton to save the country. It is a most anxious time for us all. Doris is surrounded. It is your duty, my dear, to protect our rights. I would overcome my natural feelings of modesty and contest the seat myself. Only my uncertain health could not endure the strain of an election. I opposed votes for women when the subject was first broached, but I have been converted to the opinion that women have every right to take their place in our legislatures. I converted my husband to that opinion. I do not wish to advise you in any way, but I may say that the situation is grave, very grave. We have reached a crisis. What is your advice, Mr. Hill? Do you think, as an American, that it is wrong for women to take part in political agitation? Well, Miss Quiverton, it is a very delicate subject. I know good American citizens negotiating dangerous propositions in order that their elegant wives and daughters might stroll through Rome and Florence with a calm expression on their face and the beauties of Ruskin under their arm, tracing the influence of Leonardo on Perugino. That, Miss Quiverton, is the American ideal. How chaste and beautiful. We couldn't trust our husbands to that extent. Now, Mr. Hill, would you be very shocked if I went into Parliament? On the contrary, Miss Quiverton. I would leave home at once to live in any country that had the honor of being governed by you. Doris, bringing him forward. Mr. Barrett, as my father observed, we are standing at the parting of the ways. That is the usual position of a politician. You have extraordinary personal popularity, Miss Quiverton. You will gain a large sympathetic masculine vote. But... Oh, you must, you must really. It is a patriotic duty. Think of the state of the country. What do you think of the state of the country, Mr. Barrett? Barrett, affably. Socialism is still spreading, you know. 
you see miss quiverton mr barrett agrees with me i am glad mr barrett agrees with somebody what are we going to do then we must do something i suppose you will have a strong committee to help you thanks very much i shall attend to all the secretarial work but that will be all right miss quiverton leave that entirely to me is it state or federal federal excuse me are you arranging a sale of gifts this is not a bazaar i have been asked to stand for parliament as a syndicalist i presume i really couldn't say what is our policy miss perkins social reform i thought so we are going to reform society you believe in that i hope purity of the home is our guiding principle the league has drawn up a complete manifesto what is the funny name of the constituency wombat wombat it is a most respectable district i trust so for curiously enough i myself am standing for this eminently respectable district of wombat sensation are you why didn't you tell me before i was trying to oh that was your great secret miss quiverton is the good woman candidate and i am the bad man candidate that is only a personal distinction have you any policy i have but it is not so daring as yours my policy does not propose in any way to vaccinate the community against the complaint called joy its tendency indeed is distinctly immoral shame if you have no moral feelings you might at least have the decency to excuse me sir joseph i have no desire to listen to your opinions i prefer to give you mine that all ladies present barrett pleasantly i occupy the soapbox you say socialism will destroy the purity of the home of course it will that will be one of the chief glories of socialism to the devil with the purity of the home purity is a disease and a suburban home is a horror up and away to the woods i am surprised to hear a young man be calm sir henry there is no necessity for heated argument it is our intention simply to overthrow the present form of bourgeois society silence ladies and gentlemen i beg to inform you that a reign of terror is at hand but what can you expect i am standing you see in the interests of revolutionary socialism who will vote for you you won't get in but i shall take it as a personal matter if any here present may have the effrontery to cast one such worthless vote in my favour leave my house sir a new era begins to-morrow beware yours for the revolution exit barrett uproar and babble now you see our danger disgraceful this is anarchy who would have believed it doris to various people if you really wish it quite a pleasure i assure you miss perkins voice rising above din our first committee meeting tomorrow afternoon three sharp general confusion end of act one Act Two of The Time Is Not Yet Ripe by Lewis Essen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One The Socialist Club, a bar with beer barrel, bottles, etc., two small tables, framed photograph of Karl Marx on wall. Otto, a fat, good-natured German smoking a big pipe, stands behind bar, talking to Harry Hopkins, a dark little man, bitterly in earnest. The strike is good. It will spread. Hopkins, bitterly. No, they'll go back to work. They always do. Their workers are little children, little children. How many know what they're striking for? They would sneak back tomorrow if they dared. Some of them are frightened of being called scabs and blacklegs, that's all. They're not fighting for principles. We need more propaganda, pamphlets, speeches. Yes, a million pamphlets and about ten thousand speakers. 
Ach, they not know. They not educated to socialism. The people can't be educated. They must be coerced. Ach, my friend. They won't become socialists until their backs are driven against the wall. They must be starved into socialism. A long drought and industrial depression. That's what Australia needs. Let the workers feel the pinch. Then they'll begin to think, not before. Then they'll listen to us, and we'll gather them in, organise them. You have right, right. Look here, Otto. This is the country of the satisfied working man. What can you do with people who are satisfied? Do they want the revolution? No, they believe in sane unionism. A fair day's work for a fair day's wages. And amicable relations between labour and capital. Amicable relations between employer and employee. Amicable relations between the bullock and the whip. What's the doctrine of the Labour Party? Arbitration and conciliation. Compromise. Opportunism. You are too bitter. The Labour Party must good us. Does Labour attend the International Socialist Congress? No. It sends representatives to imperial conferences and coronations. You should learn to drink. You will be more cheerful. You're too soft, Otto. You would beam benevolently over the guillotine. We must do what we can do. Propaganda, more propaganda. Starvation, more starvation. My friend, why won't you take one glass beer? Enter Peter Jensen, a big Dane. Ach, Peter will take one glass beer. Hasn't Barrett dropped in yet? Not yet. He wants to see me. We are beginning to move. Lager? Yes. Do you want be tempted, Hopkins? Beer. Ah, we're dull and sleepy enough without that. Hopkins and Peter sit at table. Otto brings beer. Rare's luck all the same. Well, what's the latest? Barrett's another lost leader. No, it's not so. I don't think so. Otto returns to back of bar. What does it matter? We trust too much to leaders. Think of Hyde, Jackson, McCallum. They began with socialism and ended in the cabinet. Ugh, who would trust Barrett? I would. He would go to the stake for these principles. You have no faith in humanity. Not too much. I believe in nature. Nature is the greatest revolutionary. Socialism will come, whether we want it or not. It has to come. Barrett is young, enthusiastic. He will preach socialism to the master class. What good will that do? The people must learn to emancipate themselves. So every man can do his hair. Barrett's only an intellectual. His enthusiasm will soon burn out. What makes you think that? There are fifty reasons. His social position, his sheep station, his money, his class training. He's not one of us. Some of our best men came from the capitalist class. Marx, Lasselle, Maurice, Liebknecht. Barrett has no character. And there's another reason. Commonplace, but sufficient. A woman. Don't talk nonsense. I knew all about that. Enter Arthur Gray, a tall, dreamy-looking young man. He's going to be married. That is no secret. To the Prime Minister's daughter. That is a good joke. A society butterfly, a leader of fashion. He will convert her. Don't you think she will convert him? What do you say, Gray? I do not believe that love is degrading. I think love ennobles, spiritualizes. Is that theosophic? It is the truth. As she is standing against him, contesting the same seat, splendid, he'll make us look ridiculous. Drop that, Hopkins. We must all support him. It will be a big fight, but we have a chance. Yes, we have a chance at last. He won't stand. You'll see. He'll draw out at the end. No, no. He will not forsake his ideal. My theosophic friend, you care too much for ideals. We must face the facts, the brutal facts. 
Socialism is a bread and butter problem. We don't want ideals. We want economics. We want... You are wrong, Hopkins. Rationalists are always wrong. Ideals build the future. Hopkins, bitterly. Let us get rid of superstition. Evolution, science, machinery. That is the materialist trinity. Gray, arguing. Matter does not exist. It is an illusion. Only spirit exists. Don't we stand for the materialist conception? I don't. Marx was wrong. Socialism is founded on science. Who said so? I don't believe that man is a machine, that nature is a machine, and that God Almighty is a mechanical engineer. Who cares what you believe? You're a traitor. You're a dogmatist. What right have you to be a member of the SFA or the IWW? The PLC's the place for you. You should be expelled. There are many schools of socialist thought. Why should we chain the party to a narrow body of dogma? We should find room and welcome for everybody. Marxists, syndicalists, the Leonites, Labourites, Christian socialists, socialists of the chair, Fabians, communists, revisionists, reformists. Go on, go on. Everybody except class-conscious socialists. That will do. Socialism is as wide as life. We must not get narrow or dogmatic. We can all do our share. Yes, but what do we do? Nothing. You with your ideals and palliatives. You're trying to kill the movement. I'm getting full up of all of you. You're all moderates. Damn your reforms and damn your parliaments. What's the good of them? We want direct action. Propaganda by deeds. Let us blow the system to hell. Exit Hopkins. Why are little men so bitter? Hopkins has a logical but very material mind. What are you doing there, Otto? I am writing article on the strike. Ach, my English is not good. Enter Sidney Barrett. Good day, comrades. The revolutionists at home. Yes, we are always fighting among ourselves. The campaign promises well. I am wondering if it is worthwhile. Don't say that. Everything is worthwhile. Every good thought, every right action is assisting the scheme of the universe. That sounds very well. Otto, see what's in the barrel. Do you drink beer, Grey? We ought to drink wine, of course. Beer is too teutonic. No, thanks. I must be off. I'm getting some facts for you. Thanks. Three lagers. Long. You'll join us, Otto? Yeah, my friend. Barrett sits at table with Peter. Otto brings beer. Good luck. They drink. We must organize an active campaign. We have enough speakers. We'll send them all over the electorate. If we do nothing else, we'll spread our propaganda. Yeah, that is so. Propaganda. Otto returns to Barr and his article. The Labour Party has missed its opportunity. We must teach the people what socialism means. Yes, something ought to be done. Are you off, Gray? I'll be in the library. You need coaching in economics. That's true. I'll trust you supply me with the facts. We'll keep the red flag flying. Yes, the flag of the future. Exit Gray. Barrett, suddenly. Peter, I can't go through this. Why? I've lost heart. She has failed me. She does not understand. How can you expect it? You understand. You are an aristocrat. Don't deny it. I know. Ah, uh, I have forgotten my past. I am a lumper. I want your advice. You have taught me more than my professors. You know life from both sides. Not that. I know society is bad. Bad on both sides. And man is bad. But they will become better. I live for the future, not for the past. Socialism is my religion, the only one I have. What do you think I should do? 
Hadn't I better give up? I've made a mess of things. No, you must go on now. That is the only way. I can't, Pisa. I have lost energy. You must. Hopkins says you are an intellectual who will desert us. I know better. I will not desert. The socialists are right. Sometimes I am troubled with scepticism. But no, the present system can't be palliated. It must be destroyed. What a miserable thing we have made of life. And how splendid life would be if we were not so prudent. You must go on. It will be a good fight. She'll be in her committee room this afternoon. I can hardly believe it. And her friends and supporters. Scandal on afternoon tea. An advanced view on surf bathing. Shall I ever convert her? Not till you get married. You must take up a firm position. Do you think so? It's a quaint conflict, isn't it? Why, we're engaged. It's too absurd. But what am I going to do? It will all come right. We trust you. You must expound the socialist philosophy. All other parties have failed. Conservatives, liberals, laborists. There is no difference between them because they only play the political game. They have no principles, not any. They do not want to lose a steady job. That is all. You would speak for the workers of the world as a revolutionary, an extremist. Yes, we want extremists. I am ready for anything at present. People must believe in socialism, must desire it. If only they could see it. Why are they so blind? We will make a campaign this country has not yet seen. What can I do, Peter? I am driven both ways, and I don't seem to have any willpower. Enter Hopkins. Hello, Barrett. Have you retired yet? He is going to stand. I hope you won't get in, then. Why? There's something in the political atmosphere that's unhealthy. I trust no politician. I wouldn't trust myself if I went into Parliament. Perhaps I will retire. Ah, what did I tell you? I knew he wouldn't stand. What's that? I knew you would desert. Why? You're not one of us. You're a rich man. Rot. I can't help that. And you don't want to offend the lady. You put sex before socialism. Shut up, Popkins. You're all the same, you intellectuals. You amuse yourself with socialism, that's all. You have no real sympathy with the working class. When it comes to the point, you throw us over. I knew how it would be. You're wrong, Hopkins. Barrett is going to stand. Is that true? Yes. I want to prove, Hopkins, that it isn't the workers who are the greatest revolutionaries. I'll go through this election to the bitter end. Do you really mean it? My campaign begins in earnest now. I had doubts. I want to get into Parliament, to criticise it, to demonstrate its fertility. Enter Arthur Gray. What's the row? We're getting up steam. Here are some figures. We'll forget the facts. Parliament is a good stumping board for propaganda. Barrett, with enthusiasm. And I mean to thump hard. Otto, behind bar. That is so. How can anyone oppose socialism when once it is understood? Everybody must be dissatisfied, the rich as well as the poor. People must desire change, any kind of change. And we needn't wait for a majority. Give us a strong fighting minority and we'll shake capitalism to its rotten foundations. That is the way to talk. We may be ready now. Nobody can predict precisely when a revolution is at hand. Socialism in our time. We'll stir things up. Yes, this is a no-compromise campaign. We want only socialists' votes. No non-unionists here. We'll give them hell upon earth. You have given me hope and enthusiasm. Otto, filling glasses. We will drink your fair good health. Rely on me. I'll talk or canvas or stick bills. Anything you like. Thanks. It moves, it moves. Otto brings round drinks. We'll have the barricades up yet. 
The people may be with us. They've never had a chance yet. We must trust the people. That is good, very good. Peter lifting glass. Comrade Barrett. Comrade Barrett. The revolution. Otto beaming. The revolution. Men drink and thump table. End of Act Two, Scene One. Act Two, Scene Two. Miss Quiverton's committee room. Table spread with electoral rolls, books, newspapers, etc. A telephone. Placards on wall. Bertie Wainwright, an athletic young man, and Violet Faulkner, a serious young lady, are working at table. Miss Perkins has assumed command. Miss Perkins at phone. Will you see about the printing at once? We'll never get through. Yes? It should have been finished yesterday. The Polynesian mission can wait. And send another one thousand cards immediately. The purity of home cards. Very well, then. No mistakes. Puts down tube. A most unbusinesslike firm. Arranging papers, etc., at table. We must get those letters away at once. What a pile! Success depends on system. How you remember things, Miss Perkins. Business is simply a matter of detail. It is a masculine superstition to suppose that women lose their heads at moments of excitement. There are two hundred and fifty letters to post. And I require three typewritten copies of our address to factory girls. Is that my job? I'll attend to that, Miss Perkins. I don't know much about these things, Honor Bright. It is not necessary to emphasize the obvious, Mr. Wainwright. Your duties will be clearly defined. Thanks. I'm awfully glad to be of service, but I don't get much time for cricket. You are still interested in cricket, Mr. Wainwright? Rather. I've just been selected for the Victorian Eleven. The Australian ideal of technical education? Miss Perkins bustling around. I think that finishes the correspondence. I forgot. Please write out an advertisement for our town hall meeting. I am talking on ideal domestic service among our farmer's daughters. Certainly. What have I got to say? I do not expect a literary composition, Mr. Wainwright. A plain statement that I am going to speak will suffice. Oh, yes, of course. Are you going now? I shall return shortly. I must run round to the League to look over our manifesto. Is there any message for Miss Quiverton? Tell Miss Quiverton we are doing splendidly. There is no need for her to worry. I shall attend to all the details. I'll take those letters myself. Picks up pile. Men always forget to post letters. Good day. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Exit Miss Perkins. Isn't an election good sport? It'll be jolly fine if Miss Quiverton wins. I'm greatly perturbed. Adoris is so willful. By Jove, it is funny for people who are engaged to oppose each other on political principles. I'm afraid I do not possess your subtle sense of humour, Mr. Wainwright. I must inform you that the engagement is going to be broken off. I, I thought it would. I went to school with Sid. So I have heard. He was eccentric then, always reading and studying. He won all the prizes. Indeed. There are even graver charges against Mr. Barrett than that. I suppose you are interested in law and politics. The pater wanted me to do law. He said it was a training for the mind. But I never had much time for study. I had time for nothing else. I never learned anything at school. Your frankness is very engaging, Mr. Wainwright. Cricket is the only subject I can talk intelligently about. They say I have the makings of a good left-hand bowler. I can swerve two and a half inches from the leg. After all, physical culture was the Greek ideal. I don't know, Miss Faulkner. I didn't do Greek. I did Latin instead. Latin was compulsory. Enter Doris. Good day. Been having an interesting chat. Barry, Mr. Wainwright has been telling me all about his studies. Miss Perkins said to tell you we were all doing splendidly. Thanks, Bertie. I was sure you would. It's so good of you to help us like this. What in the world have you got there? The new cards. Purity of the home. Miss Perkins is an ideal secretary. I don't know what I would do without her. I haven't to think at all. Bertie, rising. I'll have to hurry round with this ad. Will you want me again this afternoon? No, thank you. 
I want half an hour at the Nets. We're playing New South Wales next week. I'll be there to watch your famous swerve. I mightn't come off, you know. I can only do it with a new ball. I'll put a card in my hat for luck. Goodbye. Exit Bertie. I like Mr. Wainwright very much. He has a child, so... Doris, suddenly... I won't, Vi. I can't go on. You must. I was forced into it. I didn't mean to stand against Sydney. What will he think of me? He hasn't written for a whole week. Mr. Barrett is a socialist. He has no sense whatever of either his moral or political responsibility. Politics mean more to him than they do to me. No, oh, no, darling. They do. He has ideals. He told me he had. He wants to destroy everything. Yes, that is too true. That is the difference between you. He will only destroy while you will build up. No, I won't. I don't want to. Socialism may be a beautiful dream, but it is contrary to human nature. History and biology both teach us that men are not equal. I don't care. You haven't been in love, Vi. I don't believe in love. It is the fairest and most fleeting of all human emotions. I won't give Sydney up. I can't live without him. You must, darling. A suffragette said that man was only a biological necessity. Oh, Vi, I don't want argument. I want sympathy. You are in love only because for centuries that was woman's sole occupation. Now she realises that she has a mission and an individual life of her own. You must break off the engagement at once. Oh, Vi. You must, dearest. Think of your life work. How can I tell Sydney? He'll be so angry. You must be brave, Doris. Everything is so confused, I don't know what to do. Enter Sir Joseph Quiverton. The strike is spreading. Never in the history of the Commonwealth have we experienced such a condition of industrial unrest. You are a confirmed pessimist, Father. Not at all. That is a popular illusion regarding my true character. I am really a cheerful man. I always try to look on the bright side of things. But when there is no bright side, how can I be expected to look on it? We are making progress, Sir Joseph. I hope you have a good grip of the situation. I find the technical terms rather confusing. What is the real meaning of the referendum? A vote of the whole people. I thought that was all arranged by the caucus. Oh no, no, Doris. You must get clear ideas on these subjects. It's no use. You are a lawyer, but I could never understand political economy. You must read Hansard. I was told it would spoil my style. Enter Lady Pillsbury. Good afternoon. I can only stay a few moments. Please sit down. You must be tired. Yes, dear. I am always tired. You need a change in the country. I loathe the country. The food is so monotonous. I have some important news. Yes? That man Johnson's retiring. So Sir Henry has secured a walkover. That makes our prospects look brighter. I don't know what he can do, but he may be able to help you on the platform. I shall see that he is very brief. My husband is such a tedious speaker. Enter John K. Hill. I hope I don't intrude. Rolls may be inspected within. We are sowing the seed. Doris giving card. My card, Mr. Hill. Miss Quiverton, you are an Australian Joan of Arc. Oh, thank you. I saw your photo in the Australasian. I have sent it abroad to my friends. That is what one usually does with the Australasian. Must you really go, Lady Pillsbury? Yes, really. I have such a lot to do. I am arranging that we shall all wear white rosettes to defy the blood-red banners of the socialists. Politics absorbs so much attention that I have no time to attend to mere domestic details. For the last week, I have left Sir Henry entirely in the hands of the maids. Poor Sir Henry. I am the one to be studied, my dear. Rising. No, I must go. Being president of four leagues, I am fighting socialism in many quarters. Good afternoon. Warmest congratulations to Sir Henry. Exit Lady Pillsbury. I received a wire from Chicago today. Go ahead with the coffins, it said. And will you? We are depending on you, Miss Quiverton, to save the industry. That is the only solution of the Chinese question. Here is the latest socialist. 
a wicked paper. Organ of revolution, voice of discontent. It is the employers nowadays who have most cause for discontent. The word of a reputable merchant is no longer accepted. It contains an article by that young man, Sidney Barrett. He has blown out more hot air. Do tell me what he has been saying. John K. Reading. I have marked certain passages. Listen to this Chinese proverb on the class war. I am the rice, thou art the eater. How can there be peace between us? Every strike is right. Every strike is morally justifiable. There is no immorality save defeat. There can be no amicable relations between labor and capital, between right and wrong, till every employer is eliminated. Eliminated? Haven't I passed wages boards for the settlement of industrial disputes? The boards reduce the men's wages, do they not? And arbitration is resorted to to imprison those who raise objections. Who said that? Mr. Barrett. The man's an agitator, a red flagger, a yarra banker. John K. Impressively. That is not the finish. He goes on to propose, what do you think? What? Repudiation of the national debt. Repudiation? Confiscation. The issue, in every sense of the word, is a vital one. May I see the paper for a moment? Examines article. Speaking as a lawyer, Mr. Hill, I should say that article was seditious. I guess it is, and we're up against it good and hard. What are we going to do about it? If things come to the worst, steps will be taken to enforce the Strikes Coercion Act. I will abolish trial by jury to expedite justice. I will prohibit demonstrations on the Yarra Bank. What more can a moderate man do? Can't Barrett be arrested? Arrested? Desperate cases require desperate remedies. I think we should use diplomacy. There are more women than men in the electorate. If we work conscientiously, Mr. Barrett will be defeated. I want to help. What can I do? Gee, you'll need conveyances for your supporters. I'll hire every car in the town. What a bright idea. Motors, taxis, cabs, lorries, perambulators. Every vehicle that runs on wheels. We'll make our opponents walk. Splendid. I'll beat it to the battlefield. And remember, in the bright lexicon of youth, there is no such word as fail. I'll go with you, Mr. Hill. I must interview the Commissioner of Police. Exuant Sir Joseph Quiverton and John K. Hill, talking earnestly. Father threatens to put Sidney in prison. It's an outrage. That is not your father's intention. If he attempts to, I'll join the Socialists. You can't retire now if you wanted to. I think of the scandal. Things are worse than ever, much worse. You are still attracted towards that man. Why must I give Sidney up? Mr. Barrett wants to provoke what is described as the class war. He would abolish the rights of property. Oh, Doris, think of the poor people he would ruin. He would take away their hard-earned savings and divide them among the unemployed. It is terrible to think of the consequences. There might be bloodshed. Why don't you help me, Vi? It is a noble mission you've undertaken. I'm proud of you. Have a quiet talk, dear. I'm tired and miserable. Ring at phone. Bother. Goes to phone. Hello, hello. Yes. Oh, Sydney, why haven't you written? What do you say? Am I going on? I'm fighting for the home I haven't got. Yes, yes, you may call if you are good. I'll be here in the committee room. Violet won't mind. At once? Now? Are you coming now? Of course. Nobody will be here. Goodbye. Yours for the established order. Puts down phone. It's Sid. He's at the Socialist Club. He's coming round here. You should refuse to see him. I want a few minutes alone. You must be firm, Doris. Remember, all is over between you. You are too intellectual. It's not fair. Your duty is clear. You must not listen to his excuses or be beguiled by Specie's arguments. Now is your opportunity. Tell him the truth. How can I hurt him like that? Duty first, Doris. Promise you will give him up. Oh, Violet. You are setting an example to the English-speaking race. You are an instrument in the hands of a higher power. Miss Perkins seems to be the higher power. Doris. 
Enter Miss Perkins. Do you know we are going to have a band for our town hall meeting? The White Rose Troubadours have offered to play without remuneration. Here is a copy of our manifesto. It looks very nice indeed. But haven't we sent out enough? We must flood the electorate with instructive literature. Has Mr. Wainwright taken round the advertisements? Yes. We expect an immense crowd. Our series of addresses to businesswomen has made our good work widely known. I can't speak in public. I shall address the meeting. You may be indisposed. Thanks. I shall be. The Good Woman's Rally. Do you like that heading? It is effective. Doris, looking over manifesto. What is this? Curfew bell? Do I believe in that? Certainly. What are these clauses? Anti-cigarette crusade. Abolition of mixed bathing. The proper lighting of our parks and gardens. I don't think we should spoil our gardens with unromantic illuminations. It is all part of our general crusade against vice. We are concentrating all our energies on social reform. Are we opposed to all forms of pleasure? That is what the public demands. I seem to be frightfully strict. Don't you think things will be a little dull if I am returned? That is our objective. I hope I have forgotten nothing. So far, everything is most satisfactory. Will you have afternoon tea with me, Miss Perkins? I think we'll have time for a fruit salad. Excuse me, I will rest a little. Remember what I told you, Doris. Promise. I promise, Vi. I want a few minutes to study the manifesto. Don't worry, Miss Quiverton. I feel confident you will achieve a triumphant victory. Violet, kissing Doris. It is all for the best, Doris. Exuant Violet and Miss Perkins. Doris throws down manifesto and sits in reflective attitude. Enter Sidney Barrett. Oh, come in, Sid. Nobody is here. Barrett walks round nervously. What is the matter, Sid? You are pale. Why did God create the world? How do I know? I have something to say to you. Sidney. Yes. Aren't you going to kiss me? No. Everybody's away. I am not ashamed of kissing you before people. It is for higher reasons I refrain. Don't be so restless. What is the matter with you? This country, if you wish to know, is on the verge of a revolution. Doris languidly. Mm, so I have heard. This is no time for idle gossip. This is no time for political platitudes. I am forgetting my duty. When I am with you, Doris, I usually forget my duty. Why do you wear those perpetual red ties? They don't suit you a bit. Why are you opposing me? I suppose you have some motive. If you only knew, Sydney, why won't you give up this political dissipation? You cannot rise to my ideal. Doris anxiously. You'll be put in prison. Why not? What is the good of being a martyr for nothing? What do you propose? I don't know. I don't want to hurt you. I can't tell you. I want to explain, Doris. Promise you will be brave. Yes, Sid. What is it? This is not a hasty decision. I have not trusted to the inspiration of the moment. Don't look so serious. I can't bear any more. I have been worried all morning with people calling and telephoning and manifestos. Mr. Hill has talked about coffins. Lady Pillsbury has another sick headache. Miss Perkins has made me approve of a curfew bell in the interests of morality. Violet has said I am setting an example to the English-speaking race. And Father has assured me three times at least that the issue in every sense of the word is a vital one. I can't go on like this. I want a little peace. Not peace, but a sword. Won't you realise the importance of the position? What do you think all these strikes are for? In a period like this, one must be on one side or the other, Doris. Doris, this is a cause that demands all sacrifices. The people are with us. We must trust the people. Why have you so little faith? Violet says, oh, I can't tell you the truth. I have something to say to you. You said that before. I know I have a habit of repeating myself. One of my qualifications for a political career. Doris, will you give up this frivolous opposition and work for the cause? Violet says I am working for a cause. I hope I have been fair to you. Oh, Doris, I love you, but I cannot marry you. Forgive me. You know, Sydney, I have a generous nature. I have been thinking of you. How can you possibly live without me? This action is imperative. You do not understand my mission. 
"'Considering your environment, it is hardly to be expected that you would. "'I do not blame you. "'I am before my time.' "'Everything is very satisfactory, then.' "'Satisfactory? Why? How?' "'I had just decided that I could not possibly marry you.' "'Do you mean that?' "'Yes. I didn't know how to tell you. "'I hope I have not spoilt your life.' "'This is an extraordinary situation.' Henceforth it is a duel between us. Australia must choose between your ideal and mine. You are sure to lose. I am not on trial. It is Australia that is on trial. I am sure you will be disappointed. People don't believe in poets and martyrs and heroes and prophets. They belong in the past. Doris, do you imagine that anybody will vote for you? Of course they will. They are so stupid. Why, people even vote for father. I forgot that. We must not judge him too harshly. He bears the burden of empire. There is no more to be said. Goodbye. Goodbye, Sydney. One kiss. He kisses her. Don't say it is to be our last. She holds him. Barrett, breaking away. I am in earnest. People are waiting for a man like me. He makes for door. Sydney. He returns. One more kiss. No, no. I dare not. Just one. No. You are the good woman candidate. Goodbye. Exit Barrett hastily. Doris rushing after him. Sydney, come back. I don't want to be a good woman. She breaks down. End of Act Two. Act Three of The Time Is Not Yet Ripe by Lewis Essen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three Vacant Square at Street Corner. Night Before Election. A Liberal Rally. Motor Car Used as Platform. The usual election crowd. Speak up. Get a move on. Miss Perkins, concluding her address. We are fighting for social reform and the purity of the home. There are our banners. Are you in favor of hobble skirts? I am not in favor of small boys smoking cigarettes. Laughter. The prohibition of tobacco and alcohol would make you a better man. It is time women took their proper place in our National Assembly. Cheers. In Finland and Norway, women have asserted their right to legislate as well as vote. I am informed that in Denmark, women act in the capacity of police constables. Laughter. Why should Australia lag behind Europe? We will show tomorrow what we can do. I ask every man and woman who values home life to vote for and support Miss Quiverton, the good woman candidate. Cheers. Lady Pillsbury will now address the meeting. Miss Perkins sits down. Lady Pillsbury steps forward. What price the hat? Are you going down the bay on Sunday? Give the lady a chance. That's Bertie Wainwright. What ho? Bertie? Who got one for 97? <laughs> Laughter. Have a bit of sense. Played, Bertie. Hit him to leg. Don't be like the Googlies. I appeal to the British sense of fair play. Sit down, you loafer. That's her husband. He looks like it. Be sports now, be sports. Give the old lady a chance. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, there ain't none here. I made a mistake. Some of you are not gentlemen. Hurrah, hurrah! It is indeed time women took their proper place in the government of the country. Go home and mind the baby. She hasn't got one. Women have been kept down in the past and have had no opportunity. Fancy listening to that all day. And she's never been kissed. Laughter. Lady Pillsbury excitedly. You are afraid to listen to me. You are cowards. You don't want to hear the truth. Are you in favor of a tax on bachelors? Laughter. The socialists will destroy the home. 
They will take your children away. I wish they would take mine. Laughter. They will divide everything among themselves. They won't leave a roof to our heads. We'll sleep in the park. Lady Pillsbury losing her head. We will carry this election in spite of the hooligans. That's what you are, hooligans. Who are you? Don't talk to me. I'm as good as you. Have you ever worked for your living? Keep going, old woman. You're doing well. Have you no sense of chivalry? Have you no respect for your wives? You ain't my wife, Fanny. Speak to your husband. He's used to it. Sit down. Sit down. Your conduct is disgraceful. Disgraceful. I am ashamed of you, hooligans. That's the candidate. Lady Pillsbury retires exhausted. Cheers and laughter. There are other speakers to follow. Bring on the candidate. Come on, Doris. Doris? Doris. That's a pretty name. Miss Perkins, businesslike. As the Prime Minister has to leave us to address his supporters in the town hall, I will call on him now to make a few remarks. No doubt you are all anxious to hear him. No, no. Bring Doris on. At great personal inconvenience, Sir Joseph Quiverton consented to be present at our meeting tonight. I ask you to give him a patient hearing. Sir Joseph rises, bows to ladies, and faces the crowd. The Prime Minister. Cheers and groans. Lady Pillsbury, ladies and gentlemen, when I look round on this great gathering, representing all classes of the community... Lofar, Lofar, get work. When I look round on such a gathering as is assembled here tonight, I feel that it is the duty of all patriotic parties to sink minor differences, to forget past grievances, parochial jealousies, and standing shoulder to shoulder to take a broad national outlook. Hear, hear! Our policy, the policy of the great Liberal Party. Cheers and groans. It took a great deal to bring us together, but now we are together, it will take a great deal to separate us. Traitor! Judas! Judas! The Liberals and Conservatives fused together without the sacrifice of a single principle. You never had any, Judas. Our policy is to keep in full step with the progress of the country. I am a progressive man and a warm friend of all legitimate reform. You turned your coat, Joe. Hear, hear! But I have no sympathy with visionary ideals, chasing rainbows or the aurora borealis. Why don't you spell it? You should attend a night school, young man. Laughter. I am a plain, practical man. You're a wowser. Wowser, wowser. Who tried to stop tats? Joseph the wowser. Laughter. Wowser, my friends. I am proud of the title. What you call wowserism stands for all that is highest and noblest in the life of the community. Laughter and cheers. We must solve, in a practical manner, the problems of today. The next generation will have its own problems to solve. Of course, the Liberal proposals will evolve and expand. Talk politics. You're a wowser. Talk politics. Yes, I will talk politics. And in the teeth of opposition, I repeat that as long as I am entrusted with the leadership of this great party, I mean to continue in the sphere of practical legislation. Cheers. He's an orator, you can't deny that. Practical legislation, that is our motto. But we must be careful not to do harm. We are a debtor, not a creditor nation, and cannot afford to do anything that would penalise us in regard to our loans. The financial problem. Why don't you pay your butcher's bill? Laughter. The situation is grave and we must act in a statesmanlike manner. Confidence, confidence, that is what we seek to inspire both at home and abroad. He ain't beat yet. Go in, Joe. Give it to him. For 26 years I have held my seat in Parliament, and during that period I have never broken a single pledge. Hear, hear. 
I stand before the electors, pointing confidently to my past career as a fearless champion of progress and reform, the farmer's friend, the unswerving advocate of democratic legislation. Are you in favour of a barbed wire fence, drawn Port Phillip to keep out the Barracuda? Who are our opponents? Men of straw. Laughter. What have they ever done for labour? You never done a day's work in your life. I have fought for more work for all, higher wages for all, and general prosperity to Australian men and women. Cheers. You're a statesman, Joe. They don't like it. Shut up! This election is a turning point in the history of the Commonwealth. We are standing, as it were, at the parting of the ways. Will this great country make for progress or reaction? That is the question before us. The answer depends on you. Yes, no. No, yes. What are you talking about, Joe? Enter Harry Hopkins and Arthur Gray. They take prominent positions near Carr. If the Socialists gain a majority... They will. I have no fear of the results. I trust the people. I said, if... Laughter. Confidence in Australia will be shaken. No prudent man would dare to invest. What would be the result of such an election? I will tell you. Capital will be driven out of the country. You have said that before. Give your daughter a show. Laughter. Come on, Doris, don't be bashful. Don't you know how to be sports? Bertie made a blob, clean bold. As I stand before you tonight in the proud position of leader of a great party. Turn it up, Joe. You're getting stale. Regarding our imperial responsibilities. Now, boys, all together. Oh, Old Joe's, Joe's body, body lies a molar in. Oh, Joe's, Joe's body lies a molar in. Oh, Joe's, Joe's, Joe's body lies a molar in, in the grave, but, but his talk goes, goes marching on. on. Cheers and laughter. His, his talk, talk goes, goes marching on. on. Regarding our imperial responsibilities. Crowd shouting. Oh, Old Joe's body lies a molar in, in the grave. In the grave. But, but his talk, talk goes marching on. on. Poor old Joe. You're a has-been. Lady Pillsbury, coming forward. Shame on you. Do you call yourselves men? How is it, Bertie? Go home to your husband. Put Doris on. Come on, Doris. We have been waiting all night for you. Play the game there. Be sports. I urge on the electors the necessity of casting an intelligent vote tomorrow. The eyes of the Empire are upon us. I want to ask the Speaker a question. Get on the car. Play us a tune, Bertie. Certainly, I will answer any intelligent question. Cheers. There are two thousand men on strike. I can't hear you. Come up here. Cheers as Hopkins steps onto the car. Hopkins on car. There are two thousand bakers on strike. Who told you? Do you propose to nationalise the bread industry? My policy is to carry out the wishes of the people. Cheers. Will you nationalise bread? Man does not live by bread alone. Cheers. That's no answer. That's no answer. It is a big subject, my young friend. I would not like to commit myself to a positive answer. That is a question for sociologists. You can't. You don't know how. I didn't say I was against it. Bosh! When you are twenty years older... Will you give us government bread? And free beer? Laughter. You are a socialist, I believe. I am. So am I. But a safe socialist. Cheers. Hopkins getting down from car... I don't want to hear any more flat doodle. You're right there. You're only a bluff. You know nothing about socialism. Your question is irrelevant. The nationalisation of bread does not come within the sphere of practical politics. Cheers. Nah, no, you had him there, Joe. Put your hat in a bag. Does any other gentleman wish to ask a question? Gray goes up to Carr. 
If not, we will now pass on to more practical matters. History teaches us that we must beware of hasty legislation. Gray, on car. I would like to ask a question. Cheers. I refuse to be harassed by frivolous interruptions. If you don't know how to answer it. What is it? Will you give a bonus to babies? I have no time to go into that matter tonight. I have another important meeting to address. You don't know anything about it. No, sir. We should teach our children to be self-reliant, to depend on themselves, not on the state. Throw in your marble, Joe. The time is not yet ripe for the full consideration of such subjects. We must deal in a sound, practical manner with questions affecting the welfare of the people. The Liberal Party represents all classes without fear or favour, and exists for the equal benefit of all. Cheers. Gray retiring from Carr. He knows no better. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your patient hearing, and in conclusion, urge on you the necessity of casting an intelligent vote tomorrow in favour of the Liberal and Progressive candidates. Cheers. Sir Joseph sits down. Sir Henry steps forward. I have much pleasure in proposing a vote of confidence in Miss Quiverton, the good woman candidate. I second that. Miss Quiverton's a good sport. All in favour signify the same in the usual manner. Hands go up. Against? Carried. Three cheers for Miss Quiverton. Three cheers given. Tiger. Another cheer. I thank you on behalf of the candidate for your attendance here tonight. That is Doris. We want to hear Doris. Is Doris deaf and dumb? Come on, Doris. Miss Perkins sharply. Miss Quiverton is indisposed. The meeting is now closed. Be sure to vote for the good woman candidate. Cheers. Bertie winds up car. John K. toots on horn. The cheeky youth gives advice. At last, the car moves off amid cheers. They're off. Goodbye, Dory. Why don't you raffle the car? Goodbye, Fanny. See you later. Go on to your husband. Bertie waving banner. Vote for the good woman candidate. As the party drives away, there's a fight in the crowd. A policeman interferes and takes off one of the men. The crowd follows him. When the band is heard, the people return. Old Joe ain't done yet. He's no war horse, he is. You can't deny that. He's a gas bag. They've left a flag behind. Tear it down. Don't go yet. Barrett is going to speak here. He'll give you some straight talk. He's a socialist. This year socialry may be all right for them what has nothing, but it ain't no use for the likes of us. I ain't no socialist. You're an old blitherer. To crowd. Hold on there. Don't talk to me like that, young fella. I never heard such talking all me life. It makes me tired. Don't go yet. The fun's going to begin. Band heard approaching. Hello. Here they come. Barrett's coming. Who are they? The socialists. What is it? The Salvation Army? A straggling socialist procession, headed by Barrett, Peter Jensen, and Otto, appears with band and banners. Workers of the world unite. Revolution. Industrial unionism. Raise your standard, brother, higher still and higher. Let the thought of justice all your deeds inspire. Let your eyes be kindled with a loving Virtue for our armor, justice for our sword. Human love our master, human love our lord. So shall we be marching, fighting in accord. Cheers. Socialists take up position and put up flags. Where's the soap, folks? You can speak here. Workers of the world, unite. Comrade Barrett will now address the meeting. We haven't got motor cars, but the soapbox will do for us. Go on, Sid. Comrade Barrett. 
Comrade Barrett. Barrett gets on soapbox. Cheers from socialists. Comrades, I didn't hear the Prime Minister, but I am sure he talked platitudes. He's a better man than you. He talks politics. It is not my intention to talk politics. I don't believe in politics. Give us your program. I haven't got one. I believe in all the things you are too stupid to understand. Do you believe in immigration? No. Why bring in agriculture labourers? Haven't we sufficient dullness of our own? Australia doesn't need workers. It needs idlers. It needs Egyptologists and biblical critics, metaphysicians and Italian tennis, and it needs them very badly. Dark sense. You don't represent the working man. Of course I don't. That's why they should vote for me. Remember, it is not your business to teach me. The proletariat is always the most conservative element in society. It is my business to teach you. Are you in favour of free beer? Laughter. I've told you till I'm tired that socialism, properly understood, means much more than an economic change of society. Talk practical politics. Haven't you had enough of practical politics? What does your practical man do? He establishes a jam factory or opens a coal mine. What is the good of that? We can do without coal, and nobody wants jam. Or he irrigates a splendid dessert for the production of lucerne and dried apricots. And you applaud him for it. Fools! Why, the curse of this country, and every other country, is the plain, practical, common-sense man with his low standards and narrow outlook. We want poets, dreamers, builders of ideals. The national need is a thoroughly unpractical man. You're mad. Get your head red. Take the Prime Minister, Australia's noblest son. Laughter. He alleges he is bursting to reform things. The tote, the tariff, Bible reading in state schools, the regulation of the sale of matches. Anything, everything, nothing. When the time is ripe, he would promise to reform the kingdom of heaven when the time is ripe. But it never is. Cheers. The practical man assures us, with enthusiasm, that the time is not yet ripe for any kind of change. I tell you the time is ripe. It has been ripe for centuries. And our politicians are ripe too. Not to say rotten. Laughter. Why don't you join the Labour Party? I am an extremist. All your leaders have failed because they have tried to please you by getting down to your own level. I don't want to please you. Therefore, I am the man you should support. All things flow, said Heraclitus of old, and our party stands for the philosophy of change. Get your hair cut! Go home to your mother, Sonny. Do you believe in a state bank? No, I don't believe in anything. It's a waste of time talking to you people. If you are too ignorant to understand the new philosophy, don't vote for me. I don't want your votes. And I tell you now, I will never open a bazaar for you. I'll never send a subscription to your local cricket club. I won't find your foolish son's jobs. I won't do anything for you at all. That is my policy. Cheers. I believe in bread and the circus, especially the circus. That is why I advocate the National Theatre for the production of unpopular plays. But I don't suppose you are interested in my views. No, no. Go on, Willie. Well then, I believe in compulsory Greek in schools and universities. I believe in open-air cafes, where one could drink wine and meet one's friends, and listen to stringed quartets. I believe in picnics and festivals, a two-hour working day, and in the abolition of all useless machinery. I believe a million a year should be expended on art and I favour the suppression of daily newspapers, picture shows, ANA debates, feminine fiction, pony racing, pleasant Sunday afternoons, and all other forms of popular amusement. Does that touch the great heart of the people? No. You won't get in. I've talked for a month to large and unintelligent audiences, but agitation wearies me. However, if you believe in change, vote for me tomorrow. But if you are content with things as they are, don't. Barrett sits down. Cheers. I move a vote of confidence in Comrade Sidney Barrett, the only revolutionary socialist. I second that. 
All in favour of the socialist candidate, raise their hands. Hands go up. The black livered scoundrels against him put up their hands. The motion is carried. Cheers. The socialists make a demonstration. The red flag is waved. Cheers, etc. The red flag. The red flag. The socialists sing lustily the red flag. Don't sing that damned thing again. The people's flag is deepest red. It shrouded off our martyr dead. And ere their limbs grew stiff or cold, their heart blood died is every fold. Let her go, all together. Then, then raise the scarlet that stand and high. Within its shade we'll live and die. die. Though cowards, cowards flinch and, and traitors sneer, we'll we keep the red flag flying, flying here. End of Act 3. Act 4 of The Time Is Not Yet Ripe by Lewis Essen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 4 Sir Joseph Quiverton's Drawing Room, Election Night. Sir Joseph at phone. What is that? Don't shout! Articulate more distinctly. The Prime Minister's speaking. Any further returns? What is causing the delay? Have I won? W O N. Done? Who is done? Doubtful? Everything is doubtful. I am doubtful. You are doubtful. The immortality of the soul is doubtful. Enter Butler. Curse these Swedish machines! Why can't we have British? Hello! I can't hear you. Ring up at once if you hear anything. Very well, then. Throws down tube. The results are still delayed. This suspense is frightful. Are you safe, Sir Joseph? Not yet. It is a close contest. After all you've done for them, sir, you have given the people too much already, and yet they're not satisfied. This is the first time I have been seriously opposed for twenty-three years. The people are certainly forgetting their best friends. This could never happen in England, sir. The lower orders know their place. I have done my best. It is unbefitting a public man to do more. What an election night! Momentous issues are at stake. The eyes of the Empire are upon us. Sits down exhausted. What will they say in England? England is strong enough to be sympathetic. Look at our good work in India, in Egypt, in Ireland. It speaks for itself. We have knack of government, of administration. Just a knack, sir. It is largely a matter of birth. You are a true Britisher, Percy. Yes, sir. I was born and bred in Birmingham. With superiority. Australia is a young country. It has no hereditary aristocracy. We should assist you, sir, with more of our best public men. Australia needs more English advisers, more officers, more clergymen, more governors. You might arrange the supper room. Some of my friends will arrive soon. Yes, sir. I have iced the champagne. Cheers outside. What is that? Vox Populi. They go to window. There are some people in the street. They are cheering Miss Quiverton. I can see her car. I am restless tonight. Keep the car. I will go round to the newspaper office. There must be some results through. Yes, sir. You're a statesman, Sir Joseph. If there are more men of your stamp in the public life, democratic legislation would never have been heard of. Exit Butler. Enter Doris. Who's winning, Father? The returns are incomplete. Have you any news? Crowds are waiting round the newspaper offices, cheering and hooting. It is like a test match. 
The socialists must be doing well. There are red flags everywhere, and a noisy procession with bands playing the Marseillaise. It is quite thrilling. I must know how we stand. I will return as quickly as possible. Exit Sir Joseph. Enter Butler. Are we going to win, Percy? I don't know, miss. The lower orders vote in this country. Yes, that causes the delay. It wastes such a lot of time counting their votes. They don't deserve to vote. If I had my wish, I would take it away from them. Yes, indeed. Australia is the only country in the world where peasantry make the laws. Won't you sit down, miss? I'm too excited. An election is just thrilling. I had every car in the city painted red, white and blue, with dear little Union Jacks rushing my supporters to the poll. I voted this morning, miss. I am opposed to every form of socialism. We are opposed to everything. That is the reason of our success. Enter Bertie Wainwright. I am decorating the supper table, miss. Exit Butler. Isn't an election too thrilling? By Jove, this is a hammer. I think we're going strong. There's a crowd collecting outside. Cheers and groans outside. What is that? They rush to window. It looks like a riot. The socialists must be somewhere about. Hello, here's a bit of fun. They're chasing somebody. It's a fight. I must be in this. There he goes. He's jumping the fence. Well done. Why? It's Sid. Doris screaming. Quick, Bertie, don't let him get hurt. Bertie rushing to rescue. Hold on there. I'm coming. Exit Bertie. Cheers, groans, etc. outside. Enter Barrett through window, with coat torn, etc. Pardon my haste. I climbed the wall. Oh, Sid. I was recognized. There's fame. Bertie rescued me from the Patriots. There is blood on you. Oh, Sid, are you hurt? The secret of a happy life is to live dangerously. He staggers a little. Doris holds him and puts him on lounge. Enter Bertie. How is it, Sid? Thanks, Bertie. You're not a philosopher, but you are a man of action. Tell me what happened. No, no, don't talk. You mustn't talk. It is always a pleasure to me to talk. I was attacked by a very sanguinary body of men, in high colours. It looked like a Sopskud brigade. They were flapping flags and playing rule Britannia. It displeases me. Get some bandages, Sid. Please be quick. I'll fix him. I've played football before today. Exit Birdie. I'm sorry, Sid. There is no cause for anxiety. It seems as if responsible government is going to be restored. Enter Butler. There is a socialist here, miss. Never mind, he's still a man. Enter Bertie with cloth. Is that toga for me? Hush. Is there anything I can do, miss? No thanks, Percy. Exit Butler. Doris and Bertie bandage Barrett. It's nothing at all. Who's in the lead? There's some delay. Will you run down to the city and find out what's going on? With pleasure. I have six cars outside. Are you sure you'll be all right, Sid? Yes, thanks. I won't be long. Don't hurry, Bertie. Exit Bertie. Oh, Sid. He draws her to him and kisses her. The fate of all reformers. St. John was right. The world hates everything that is good. Are you comfortable there? Perfectly. I have missed you a lot. I had to see you tonight. I had to tell you this election won't make any difference. The world of politics is well lost for love. Men are nobler than women, I think. I am not noble. I have deceived you. You thought I was a strong man. Women love strength, even brute strength. A neolithic taste. But I am not strong. I am weak. You mustn't say that. I admit it. In the old days, when we lived in caves, did not the hunters go forth and slay the bear? That was man's work. It is still man's work. Women demand that she shall go forth and conquer, even on the stock exchange. I am not a conqueror. I cannot slay the bear. I don't want you to. Yes, you do. You want to love a strong man. You want to be ruled, dominated. No, I don't. You forget I am emancipated. You do. All women do. They love men of action, conquerors, heroes. You always had absurd notions regarding women. Why did you love me? Wasn't it for my ideas? 
my brilliant ideas? No, I don't care for your ideas, not apart from you. Ideas are like fashions, they soon change. Men change their ideas as women change their hats. I don't love you because you are a communist or a pragmatist or an atheist or a post-impressionist. I don't love your ideas. I love you, Sydney. That is all I wanted to know. They embrace. Enter Sir Joseph Quiverton. No news. The wires have been cut. To whom do I owe the honour of this visit? To your supporters. They chased me over the back wall. It is Mr. Barrett. Leave my house, sir. Barrett, trying to rise. I am afraid I can't. And it is not your house, Sir Joseph. I am abolishing private property. Mr. Barrett is my guest. The crowd has gone away. You will be comparatively safe. Mr. Barrett is wounded. Don't rise, Sid. You need rest. I don't need rest. I need action. We all do. I thought you were giving up politics to devote all your attention to me. What could Mr. Barrett do in Parliament? Destroy it. What else is there to do with Parliament? To create, one must destroy. Sir Joseph, huskily. We have universal suffrage. I opposed it, but we have it. Parliament represents the people. Pardon me, Sir Joseph. Parliament does not represent the people. Parliament represents the stupidity of the people. That is the foundation of representative government. I am a progressive man. I have always believed in a policy of progress and reform, but utopian socialism does not come within the sphere of practical politics. When the time is ripe... But it never is, is it, Father? I am a safe socialist. History, my young friend, has a habit of repeating itself. History may be a record of crimes and blunders, but I am not cynical enough to believe that history will ever repeat you, Sir Joseph. Enter Butler. Mr. John K. Hill. Enter John K. Hill. Exit Butler. Good evening. Are the numbers up? We expect word every minute. This country is swifter than I thought. Reminds me of Uruguay. You know Mr. Barrett? I have heard of him. Enter Butler with Torn Union Jack. The grand old flag, sir. It was just brought round. It must have blown over. Thanks, Percy. It was torn during a discussion, sir. Sir Joseph takes it up reverently. It was a common hawker who brought the flag. The Bottle Accumulators Union. Loyal to the flag. Exit Butler. Tis only a bit of bunting. Made in Germany, probably. Sir Joseph hangs up flag. Enter Butler. Sir Henry and Lady Pillsbury. Enter Sir Henry and Lady Pillsbury. How are you, Doris? I can't breathe for excitement. I have been ill all day. How do we stand now? It is impossible to obtain reliable information. This morning I felt certain of victory. Now my confidence is shaken. Elections are always uncertain. Enter Butler with wire. Wire, sir. Blare of trumpets. What is that hideous noise? I loathe the cornet. Some of our supporters have returned the band. Exit Butler. Sir Joseph reading telegram. Returned. Immense majority. Oh, thank God I have done my duty. He sits down. He is warmly congratulated. Thank you. Enter Butler. More wires, sir. Congratulations, Sir Joseph. Thanks, thanks. Now, sir, you have him in your power. You must be firm, sir. In my opinion, speaking as an Englishman, you should call up to the military and shoot the paid agitators. May I take the liberty of inviting the servants to a glass of wine? I seldom touch Australian wine myself. We will drink to your help, Sir Joseph. You have risen from the ranks as state agent to prime minister. Exit Butler. Sir Joseph reading telegrams. The Liberals are winning. Winning all along the line. They crowd round. Sir Joseph tears one open after another. Crabbe returned. Easy victory. He will checkmate the extremist. Smith? Muddle? Level-headed man. Victoria? 
big Liberal majority. New South Wales, Liberal victory assured. The people have returned to their senses. There has been some mistake. Where are the socialists now? Shouts, cheers, trumpets, etc. Barrett rushing to window. In revolt. The proletariat in revolt. Rule Britannia is played. Barrett stops and addresses company. The masses still think imperially. The people don't want changes. Barrett dramatically. No, the people fail, but the cause goes on. He returns to lounge. Isn't it time I was returned? Yes, yes. I have to return thanks at the town hall. You must say, Father, this delay never occurs again. The company is talking excitedly. The patriotism of the great dailies is most commendable. I shall recommend the editors for birthday honours. This election will be historic. It has profound significance. Tis not in mortals to command success. Our homes are safe. Australia is a most extraordinary country. Do you like Australia now, Mr. Hill? We're going right ahead. You finance incontinence, I know. John Kay spreading himself. Early business training. When I was a struggling young man in Chicago, my own hometown, where pleasant-faced cows stand in silvery streams, I turned over a thousand dollars every consecutive morning, just to give me an appetite for lunch. You seem to lead a fast life, Mr. Hill. The doctor's orders, Lady Pillsbury. Enter Violet. Doris. Darling. Return. <clears throat> return at the head of the pool. She falls into Doris's arms, breathless. People crowd round Doris with congratulations, all excited. I can't speak. There must be some mistake. Not at all. The public never makes a mistake. Are you quite sure, Violet? Yes. An overwhelming victory. Responsible government will now be restored. I cannot condole with you, Mr. Barrett. I think your defeat will be the salvation of the country. Thank you, Lady Pillsbury. It shows what women can do if they are only given the opportunity. John Kay stepping forward. I think the influence of women should permeate every phase of political life, and purity, and elevate it. Australia, this virgin continent, is now represented by a refined young lady like Miss Quiverton. I congratulate you. As an American, I can only say I hope and trust my country will soon take its place in this forward movement. Enter Bertie. We're in. Hurrah! Three cheers for Miss Quiverton. Cheers given. Bertie exuberantly. I feel I could step out and hit the googlies clean out the ground. Thank you, Bertie. I'll send a Marconi gram to Chicago right off. I'll have to get busy right here, or it's time little Willie came off the roads. Can you stand a shock, Sid? That is what I need. It would be a new sensation in this city. Bertie to company. Mr. Barrett has lost his deposit. What a veritable triumph! And serves you jolly well right. Miss Quiverton wins by an 8,000 majority. You only got 107 votes. A hundred intelligent people in one electorate. There is hope for the country still. Enter Miss Perkins, unemotional and businesslike. Congratulations, Miss Quiverton. Everything has been most satisfactory. Our success has been almost entirely due to the Women's League. All parties have worked well. It is very wonderful, but I think I shall have to resign my seat. Good gracious, why? I don't think I would care for politics for every day. I prefer to keep it as a hobby. You mustn't think of it, my dear. You are too emotional, Doris. You have an impetuous nature. Doris, sweetly. I mean, I could not do the position justice. But Mr. Barrett might stand again and bring on the class war. I am tired of politics, too. Who can lead if there is nobody to follow? I have no intention of resigning in favour of Mr. Barrett. I do not think Mr. Barrett is a fit and proper person to represent this constituency. I rather hope you will take my place, Miss Perkins. Thank you, Miss Quiverton. If you desire it, it may be difficult to arrange. Enter Butler. Supper is served, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to take a glass of wine in honour of the occasion? 
I am sure you are all dying for supper. It has been a most nerve-wracking day. I am proud of Australia tonight. Excellent John Kay and Lady Pillsbury, Sir Henry and Miss Perkins, Bertie and Violet. Will you join us, Mr. Barrett? On such a night as this, political antagonisms are forgotten. Barrett, rising. Thank you, Sir Joseph. In a few moments, Father, I have something to say to Mr. Barrett. We await your pleasure. Exit Sir Joseph, followed by Butler. My dreams and reality have not harmonised. Never mind, Sidney. I am tired of the proletariat, tired of Australia. Australia is too British. The proletariat is too conservative. I told you people would not vote for you. You are too clever. It is quite impossible to create a revolution in this country. The people don't desire it. They wouldn't recognise it if they saw it. Of course not. Didn't I tell you that all along? Our people are contented with things as they are. They have no ideas, no aspirations. South America is more interesting country to live in than Australia. Less Saxon, more Spanish. The blood is hotter there. Things happen. Nothing will ever happen here. Do you always want to stir up strife, Sid? Life is conflict. Love is conflict. Embracing her. They will hear you inside. Barrett releasing her. Do you think the masses desire freedom, joy, splendor? Do you think they want to overthrow society? Doris, firmly. I do not. They don't want anything. They want to be left alone. People don't like being disturbed. An election is held. Politicians babble. Newspapers warn. The nation votes. What happens? Nothing. Things remain exactly the same as they are. And are the people... The enlightened democracy, disgusted with that? No, they chair, they actually chair. They wave penny flags, and some blow through a cheap cornet. Why, they rejoice at stagnation, they revel in it. We won't bother about them any more. Damn the democracy! I am happy tonight, I am free. I can laugh and love and live. Embraces her again. I prefer you like that, Sid. I have you now, you are all mine. Tell me. Yes, we are alone in the world. Great uproar, trumpets, cheers, etc. They are cheering the revolution that wasn't. Enter Bertie, followed by Violet, Miss Perkins, Lady Pillsbury, and John Kay at short intervals. A little later, Sir Henry and Sir Joseph. Bertie running to window. What a crowd outside! And the flags! It's like a French fit! Cries of Liberalism, Quiverton, Pillsbury, the good woman candidate. The band is out of tune. Democracy is always out of tune. Enter Butler. There's a big crowd below, sir. They are trying to get into the garden. Shall I let them in? It's a special occasion. Certainly, Percy, certainly. It's me for the swamps, me for the tall timber. It has been a most satisfactory election, after all. As you eloquently expressed it, Sir Joseph, we have escaped from the arms of the vultures. The crisis is past. I shall sleep tonight, sir. Exit Butler. Father, Sidney and I are engaged again. Sir Joseph excitedly. I congratulate you both on your choice. Goes away. Where shall we go for our honeymoon? Somewhere abroad. I know, Japan. I want to see a democratic country, a free country. The United States, sir. France, I suppose. No, a revolutionary country. I recommend Uruguay. That's rapid. No, let's go to England. Cheers, etc. grow louder. Enter Butler. The people want a few words from you, sir. I'll speak first. No, Sid, you will speak afterwards on my behalf. Sir Joseph makes slowly for window. The people expect a few words from me. I have nothing prepared. Great cheering as he goes to window and stands on chair. The people group round him. Butler stands at his side with flag. Sir Joseph, addressing crowd below, in oratorical style. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the proudest moment of my life. The great Liberal Party has succeeded in restoring responsible government on the broad platform of progress and reform. Loafer, wowser! 
I thank the people of this great commonwealth and the public-spirited press Smooger. for their patriotic support during this great battle for political liberty. Cheers! And in placing us in the proud position we occupy tonight. Cheers, then a slight lull. Barrett, cheerfully. Those are the people I was trying to emancipate. The time is not yet ripe, Sydney. I mean to continue in the future as I have in the past. The time is not yet ripe. The time is not yet ripe. Great cheering, trumpets, uproar, etc. Butler waves flag. Barrett holds head in his hands. End of Act 4 End of The Time Is Not Yet Ripe by Lewis Essen